Have we got somebody upstairs? It's somebody, you go upstairs. What do you mean calls? No. It's not. Good morning. If I were a right-wing conservative, I'd still be pretty mad at uh, Michael Wilson, the Minister of Finance, who brought down the budget. And I'd probably be mad because there was no gore on the floor. It was a kind of nice, middle-of-the-road budget, which did not, as many Tories want to be done, attack the social safety nets of Canada today. It's a budget which has apparently been attacked by the international banking community. It's a budget which is based on two uncertain economic assumptions. One, that the price of oil will go to about $22.5 Americano, and meanwhile it's down to $12.5 spot and $14 to $18 contract. And it's also on the assumption that the Canadian dollar will be strong. Yeah. Canadian dollar is above 70 cents today because it's being supported by our tax monies. I'm just waiting for Mr. Wilson, the finance minister, to arrive. By the way, um, uh, the Prime Minister is also in town today, speaking here and in uh, Prince George. But just to refresh you on the tough face that Mr. Wilson put on his budget, here's what he said when he brought it in. When the government came to office, we encountered a debt problem of massive proportions. For 15 years, successive governments financed more and more spending by borrowing more and more money. The bills were passed to future generations. The buck was passed to us. Well, Mr. Speaker, the buck stops here. And the buck also stops here because Mr. Wilson is behind schedule this morning and is not yet in the studio for what should be a reasonably straightforward interview on the economic prospects of this beleaguered nation. Mind you, the nation is largely beleaguered in the West and in the Far East because the unemployment rate in Toronto today, in Ontario today, is below 8%, while the unemployment rate in British Columbia has dropped a mere smidgen from 129 to 12.8%. Many questions for Mr. Wilson when he gets here. Also on the program this morning, we have the ineffable pollster par excellence, Martin Goldfarb. He's been perhaps uh, creating um, the necessary responses for governments and for politicians since about 1965. And I sometimes wonder if pollsters are, in their own way, kind of uneasy people who can manipulate public opinion. But we'll have that out with Marty Goldfarb after Mr. Wilson has arrived and has gone. In the meantime, however, because it's difficult to put Marty on and then throw him off again, I'm going to take your calls on the toughest questions you can think of that I, regarded as a lily-livered middle-of-the-roader, should put to Michael Wilson. What do you mean, calls at this time in the morning? Yes, we're waiting for the finance minister. Give me some of your ideas after the break. <laughs> The buck stops right here with Michael Wilson, the Minister of Finance. Mr. Wilson, is it not a fact that due to your two very uncertain economic assumptions on interest rates and on the price of oil, that your great budget where the buck stops is in the process now of collapsing? Jack, no. The, uh, the stock market has been up every day since the budget. I think that is a vote of confidence from the business community and from investors. The dollar had a couple of bad days right after the budget, but since then it's steadied away, and I think it's over 71 today. It is, no, it's 70.86, but the fact yeah. remains is that you're supporting that budget, that dollar through the Bank of Canada, no. like mad. No. You spent some billion something since the budget oh, that, came down. That, that was uh, last, uh, last month, during the, the major intervention that we had in the early part of the month. May I put it to you quite brutally, though, that your 22.5 <laughs> US price for oil 
is nowhere near. Spot price is 12 and a half. Interest rates with the American bank rate going down half a percent today are going to make it very difficult for you to get below the magic figure of $30 billion deficit. No. Jack, I think that the interest rate assumption is going to be seen as uh, quite a realistic and conservative assumption. As the interest rates go down in the states, it makes it even more realistic. As far as the oil price is concerned, the important thing from a budgetary standpoint in making that $30 billion figure is what happens to the bottom line. Yes, there is some loss of revenues as the price of oil goes down, but yes, the economy is improved as the price of oil goes down. In a broader sense, interest rates are lower, and that is an offset as far as the, uh, the federal government budget is concerned. That figure below $30 billion, a $29.5 billion figure for the deficit, I think is a good figure. You think it's going to stick, but yes. yet at the same time, I think you Jack, I said the 33.8 figure for this year was a, uh, was a good figure. We made it work. It's going to come in on target, and uh, I say the same thing about next year. Well, now you're now in the West, Mr. Wilson, a vastly different kettle of fish from the East. This morning we got the new unemployment figures. Ontario, below 8 percent. British Columbia, 12.7, down 1 percent. What in the budget is going to create jobs for the very hard-pressed people in Alberta and British Columbia? The best thing that we can do in the budget is get that deficit down so interest rates will come down. That will help every industry, every town, every village, every big city in Western Canada as well as uh, the, the whole of Canada. The other thing that we're uh, bringing in, as you know, are these international banking centers. Uh, we have identified Vancouver as well as Montreal as being two places. Vancouver, very important, because it looks out into the huge Pacific Rim, a place where there's enormous growth potential for Canada. We want to see Vancouver as being the focus of that. Mr. Wilson, I've interviewed you before, and you're a good, don't shut a right-wing Tory, are you not? I'm not a right-wing Tory. I'm a middle-of-the-road Tory. Well, that was certainly less... But I am a Tory, Jack. You are a, you are a Tory, but that was certainly less than the kind of budget had you been Prime Minister, you would have wanted to bring in. It is the right budget for the right time. And I think that uh, when we see the, the economy develop this year and when we see the, the impact of that budget, it's a balanced budget. There's a budget, in the, a good budget, in the sense that we're getting our fiscal problem under control, but we've also found room to help those Canadians in need, those parts of the country in need. And that is a, a good balanced budget. Also looking ahead to what we can do for research and development. We put some money in there. But what have you done for the West? I mean, Small the business. The there, Liberals used to give us at least masses of money for job creation to keep people off the streets. There's there's $800 million of, of job creation money, but it's a different type of job creation. It's not creation. this year. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This type, the, the, the job creation money that uh, is going into Flora McDonald's programs is good job creation money because it, in, it uh, combines training so that people who are out of a job now can learn things, uh, learn how to get a job, learn a skill to get that job. And that's very important. Mr. Wilson, you and I have both been around a long time. I've gone through all the liberal training programs and job creation programs and advances to this and that, and we have yet to see, even from the liberals, any real job production in British Columbia. The, Jack, the difference, the difference is that the job creation programs previously had been more make-work programs, very short term. Our job creation programs is, uh, it combines training, career development, so that someone who is taking the, uh, involved in one of these job creation programs is going to be much more capable of getting a long-term permanent job with a skill. The skill is very important. Back to your basic budget. It is a fact that you, were you not tempted really to hammer unemployment insurance, which is costing us billions, and which many conservatives think is far too generous and far too uh, not enough incentive to make people work. Would you not have liked to cut back on unemployment insurance qualifications and benefits? We have a, a review on right now with the Forger Commission that uh, should be reporting uh, this summer, early September. That will give us recommendations as to how we can change the unemployment insurance system. Any changes that we, we make in unemployment insurance has to wait uh, until that report comes out. You did make a fairly broad hint in your budget speech that you are planning to go after the uh, uni sacred trust of universal access to allowances, did you not? We said that uh, the, those universal programs like old age security and family allowances will continue to have universal access. 
In other words, a young fellow like you can still get the OAS, but if you're in uh, upper income, if you're, if you're upper, an upper income Canadian, we want to use a tax system to tax uh, in, in some one way or another, reduce the benefit. Reduce the words, benefit that you would get because you don't need uh, as much of a benefit as those in lower income but brackets. why didn't you do that now? Well, we've done it as far as the family benefits are concerned. The family allowance, we've shifted from reducing the uh, old age or the, the, uh, the child tax exemption, which helps, helps uh, upper income Canadians, and we've increased the child tax credit, which helps lower income Canadians. So we've shifted the benefit away from the upper income into those Canadians who need it the most, and we had a little bit of money on the table left for, uh, for applying to other priorities. That's the family allowance that's not giving on the cost of living until it increases about percent And that was, that was the other element of it. And uh, then, of course, you wanted to do the same with old-age pensioners, but you were beaten in the Cabinet discussions on it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't expect you to tell me that. Now, next point. What about... Uh, not job creation. My friend John Turner, your friend, called this a mean-spirited budget. I saw that. But I also saw reporters who are saying these liberals don't know where they're going, they're hypocritical, they're, uh, they're saying one thing uh, that is entirely different from uh, what they would do. They're just trying to play politics with it. You know, Jack, uh, you know how the, the, uh, the opposition plays politics with these things. As you did when uh, you were in opposition? But I put forward options. You look back at my speeches when, I'm, uh, when I was finance critic, I always put forward an option. But what has not come forward from Mr. Johnson, their critic, Mr. Garneau, their uh, associate critic, or Mr. Turner, is any different ways of treating things other than uh, criticizing what we've been doing. It's very easy to criticize, but if you don't put up the options, which I did in opposition, and they're the things, by the way, that we are doing right now, that I said we would do in opposition as the optional approach. Let's take an overall look at your budget then for the next year. You've cut about five billion. You'll have an effective five billion cut from the 33 billion, right? Yeah. Right, round about that. Uh, yeah. And you've hammered the middle class for for uh, super tax on super tax, a million and a half in extra tax revenue from those who are working in this country, correct? Well, let me, you say... That's what you've done. Uh, well, you, you might use, uh, you've used some words that I wouldn't use. Uh, a, we have not hammered. We have increased their taxes, yes, a 3% sur surtax. So we're, we're asking them to pay 3% more of their federal tax. Which has and been increased by 5 and 10. Well, that, that is going to be off at the end of this year. That's off at the end of this year. So there's, uh, there's a, uh, a sequence here. But the important thing to remember, Jack, is uh, something uh, the, the middle income people uh, are about 75, 80% of the population. So that if I'm going to do anything on taxes, they have to be a part of it. And that's, uh, that's just a fact of the numbers that, uh, in the, the makeup of the population of Canada. So instead of going hog wild on cutting expenditures, you've taken that extra billion and a half from the middle class and, and well, cutting 500 million from your non discretionary expenditures. This is where, we, uh, where I want to make it very clear. 70% of what we're doing to reduce the deficit is in expenditure cutting. We have tried to clean up Ottawa as much as we can, squeeze out all the waste and inefficiencies that we can up there, reduce the overlap, reduce the duplication of services, and that is about 70% of the, the spending, of the deficit reduction over, uh, over this uh, five-year period. Last year was about 90% was in the spending side. So we are trying to clean up our act before we ask uh, Canadians to share with us in getting this, this big burden off our backs. Uh, you're laying off 5,000 civil servants this year, is that correct? We, are, we, are, we are reducing the size of the public service by 5,000. We're asking senior, senior public servants to take a, a freeze in salary, and their, their normal salary increase. We as uh, members of Parliament have taken a $1,000 cut. Mr. Mulroney has taken a $20,000 cut last year and this year, and ministers are taking, a, I think it's a $9,400 cut. So we are putting our, uh, uh, we are saying we are prepared to move first, take some leadership here, say that we're prepared to cut ourselves before we're asking Canadians to, uh, to cut uh, through, uh, through a small Are you increase. not, however, terribly concerned by the two assumptions on the oil prices and the interest rates. If you don't achieve those targets, and it wouldn't seem you can achieve it on oil, your budget's got to be. 
No, I... It's got to be down the tube Jack, as far as predictions are Jack, concerned. Jack, I stand by the, the bottom line impact of that. As I said, on the oil price, there's a, there's a double impact. One, you, uh, we lose revenues from the oil and gas industry, but we gain revenues as uh, consumers have more money uh, to spend as, uh, as interest rates come down. Secondly, the interest rate assumption, I think if you ask me back a year from now, I'll be pointing to the fact that that 9.5% assumption was probably on the conservative side. Wilson indicates a year from now, interest rates might be below 9.5%? Yes. After the break. This is the reality which, with which this government has had to deal. A reality that threatened rising debt, falling confidence, a falling dollar, rising interest rates, slower growth, and even higher deficits. That is the vicious circle we had to break. The dollar is what now, Mr. Wilson? 71.10, I was just told. And you haven't been supporting it in the past couple of days. No, it's, this is, there, there's been good two-way flows of commercial and, and, and uh, capital-type transactions. I think the, the stability is returning into the market after some pretty volatile periods. It's been a very volatile time in the international money markets. You've got to realize that. It's been a very volatile time in our employment situation in British Columbia, too. Mm -hmm. And we lack faith in any government at the moment because of our massive unemployment and lack of leadership from Victoria. Can you help us? Well, I'm, uh, I'm not going to comment on that because you know more about that than I do, Jack. Well, I wouldn't suggest that. Now, <laughs> one thing we do know is, however, that while you hammered us with 1% on the federal sales tax, which is going to be reflected at 4 or 5% or 6% retail, isn't it? The, uh, are you talking about the business transfer tax? No, I was going to come to that. No, and then okay. you're going to give us a cleaner, heavier tax next year called well, what, the business transfer well, tax? What we're talking about there is reducing the rate but broadening the base so that uh, the impact on the consumer will be essentially the same. A business transfer tax? Yes. Is that a, a kind of overall sales tax yeah it's a what the a sales tax or a commodity tax uh, it's it's uh, it's a tax related to the the increase in the activity that is uh, brought about by one particular company and, and it will apply the the uh, the whole process and it will apply to services as well as commodities it will have a very broad base right now the menu the federal sales tax today is just on manufacturing companies and 40 years ago when that came in manufacturing represented about 50 percent of the economy now it's about 20 percent and uh, only about two-thirds of manufacturing is taxed so it's not a fair tax and there's a, there's a lot of things wrong with it we're looking at a simpler tax, one that is broadly based and with a lower rate. Now, uh, the left wing says that the corporations have been given uh, many given concessions in your corporate tax structure. In other words, a good old Tory business of helping the right wing and not helping the workers. Well, the, the result of both the corporate tax reform and the, the surtax on, uh, on uh, corporate profits will, I think it's uh, next year or the next couple of years, will be... Uh, uh, something like a uh, billion dollars worth of additional taxes. So they will be paying their, their fair share. But you've got to remember, Jack, that the tax system in Canada has to be competitive with other countries or else our businesses won't be competitive. They won't be able to create the jobs. And if they don't create the jobs and people won't be able to, uh, they won't be able to get the work, they won't be able to pay the, the, the personal taxes. So that's why we have to be conscious of what is going on in other countries when we establish our corporate tax system. It seems to be t a Conservative Party dogma at the moment. The, the reason our gasoline prices, despite the odd little drop recently, are so high is because we Canadians must learn to pay for social services at the gas pump. Is that the official government policy? Well, there's no question that between the, the provincial governments and the federal government, the federal government tax is seven cents a liter. Uh, they, uh, they, the two governments levy tax that is not levied in the United States, as an example, but quite a bit less. Taxes in Europe uh, are quite a bit higher than, uh, than gasoline taxes here. So uh, but uh, uh, Pat Carney has said, and it's happening, that as the the uh, lower price uh, crude oil flows through the system, the refineries and so on, then 
uh, we'll see lower prices here. And as you said, we're starting to see the signs of that, and I think we'll see more signs of that because we have a, a deregulated system now, thanks to Pat Kearney. Now, as, as it happens, though, as we go along the road, is it not possible you'll re be required to put an impost on gasoline to pay for the social safety nets because of your gradual reduction in the increase of uh, transfer payments to the provinces? No, I think, uh, I, I don't think we'll have to do that. Uh, some people encouraged me to do that in this budget, and I said, no, I don't think we should, uh, we should do that. We have a, a one cent, an in, a one cent a liter increase coming uh, on January 1st, 1987, and I think that's enough. One cent a liter increase on federal tax? On, on gasoline. On gasoline. Yeah. Which, of course, will pay the appropriate increase in the provincial tax at the same time, no doubt. Very, very small uh, increase. See, coming from Central Canada, you have a, a, an air of confidence about you. Can you give me something, hope for the West? Our lumber industry is uh, producing well, but employing many seen? fewer people. Our mining yeah. industry is in very bad shape. Mm -hmm. Now, but, what but can what, you do to help us? What just happened today in the United States, in Germany, and Japan? Interest rates went down. The, the, the governments dropped their interest rates. It's very significant that they all did them the same time. Now, what happens here? is that all interest rates go down, housing starts to increase, that's going to help the lumber industry. As uh, more economic activity occurs in these, uh, these major industrial countries, uh, a major exporting province like British Columbia is going to benefit. Meanwhile, those with less than 15000 a year will get their extra $300 check at Christmas for the child tax well, credit. Well, that is to stop people from, uh, from uh, they won't have the need to uh, have those checks discounted at very high rates of interest. So we're helping the lower income Canadians get some funds spread over the year rather than getting them just at tax time. Are you confident that the post office can break even in two years without the most abysmal labor relations in the interim period? Well, they settled. Don't forget, they, they settled last... Uh, letter last, carriers. Uh, the letter carriers have settled and the others have settled without a strike. Now, I think that there's an understanding in the post office and uh, both the, the labor and management that we have to provide better service and we have to get the costs down. They've been working on this. What we're saying is we are, uh, we are determined as a government to ensure that uh, that service is uh, improved and that we do get costs down. We're, we're giving them a pretty tight time frame, but uh, we think that discipline is important. We think it's very important that Canadians see that this very high profile part of government is better managed uh, and uh, provides that better service. Your questions to Michael Wilson, the Honourable thereof, Minister of Finance in the government at Ottawa after the break. Well, the Conservative Cabinet promised to tell the story all across the country because they don't like the press gallery in Ottawa. <laughs> you don't like the press gallery in Ottawa uh, either. I love every one of them, Jack. You just don't think they tell your story. Well, I just want to make sure that the story is accurate, so that's why we're here. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. Mr. Wilson, during the election, your party promised to clean up patronage mess that the Liberals had, uh, had started. As a matter of fact, during the television debates, I, I well remember John Turner getting hell from Brian, Brian Mulroney about some patronage appointments. Since you... Be uh, become government, you've uh, appointed over 3,000 people to the trough, and I want to know how much that costs the taxpayers. How can you possibly go to the taxpayers and ask for more money when you lied, your party lied to the taxpayers during the election? Well, I don't believe that we lied during the election. Let me make that very clear. But uh, let me make two points on that. One, it isn't costing the taxpayers a penny more because all we're doing is replacing people in jobs. And I make, no, uh, I make no apologies for what we have done here because there were Liberal appointees in the, uh, those jobs before and people voted for a change. A lot of government is done by people and commissions and boards and tribun tribunals and things like that. So we are putting good qualified people. Yes, some of them are conservative, but also some of them have no politics at all. Others are in, uh, in the new Democratic Party. And uh, I think that we have a, a good, well-qualified group of appointments that uh, I stand behind. I think they're good people. I admire you for your straight face, Mr. Wilson. I can certainly think of a couple of liberals and a couple of NDPs that have been appointed, but, sir, the vast we... mass of appointments have all been to good conservative no, workers. No, Jack, wrong. 
wrong. We have uh, appointed fewer as, uh, as a percent than uh, any previous government, and that, that's a fact. I hate to mention the subject, but Mr. Nielsen yesterday, this is a straw in the wind, uh, almost apologized for a mistake in that Marcel Tremblay put out a letter urging that more than a billion a year in untended federal contracts go to members of the Brian Mulroney Club. You're aware of that, aren't you? That was a mistake by that MP, wasn't it? Well, I don't know anything about the letter. I'd, uh, I wasn't around yesterday, well, but... Uh, I'm only going I... by, by the nation's paper of record. Uh, all our mistakes, says well, I Nielsen. see that's above your morning smile. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. Uh, you talk about uh, the West Coast economy being down. Uh, one area that I've been quite concerned about is the shipbuilding industry. Why isn't the West Coast participating in the naval buildup? In the? In the Navy frigate program. Well, I believe that uh, these were tendered jobs. Uh, uh, I know that... Uh, uh, a couple of a couple of the the shipyards in eastern Canada won some tenders there, uh, but I'm sure that uh, if the if the western shipyards had tendered and they had the the appropriate tender, they would have been part of it. Yeah, no special effort. So we want contracts fed to the west coast like the Liberals used to feed them to Quebec. That's what we want. We need well, the jobs. Yes, I understand. And uh, we're, Jack, we're, we're we are concerned about the higher levels of unemployment here in uh, in BC relative to uh, parts of uh, other parts of Canada, particularly my province. And I think that what we've done here in getting interest rates uh, down, as I expect will happen in, as a result of this budget, it will be better for BC. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name's Jamie Sullivan, and I'm a single parent with one child, and I live in, in Vancouver. And uh, I've got a couple of important questions to ask you. One is, why did the pensions for housewives, why were they not included in this budget? And that was promised, and it never, it never happened. And another question I have is, why was the, the family allowance de-indexed? You just said a little while ago that, that uh, you were giving everybody $300 in November to, to help out the poor, but by de-indexing the family allowance, you're actually hitting the poor even harder. Well, Jamie, we have uh, a, a, a study going on now with the provincial governments who have to be part of any housewives' pension. That is going on right now, and we hope that we'll have the results of that study in about a year's time. As far as uh, the change in the family benefits, don't forget we increased this year, I think by $70, the child tax credit. It will be increased again next year and again in the year after. That will more than offset the, uh, the change in the, the indexation of the family benefit. But you're also getting an acceleration of that check and uh, into November, $300. And you're also going to see uh, uh, a, um, a low-income tax credit for uh, low-income Canadians that will offset the impact of the sales tax changes. Those are all helping lower-income Canadians. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Uh, morning. Good morning. I'd like to thank Mr. Wilson for nothing for, uh, for agriculture in the last budget. You keep talking about, about creating jobs. Agriculture can create lots of jobs in B.C. and all of Canada if you do something to help agriculture. In well, B.C., we're the second largest industry. Uh, uh, you help the farms, you help the, the community, the province, and the whole country. You made a lot of good press, a 6% for farmers. Uh, Seven hundred million dollars. Actually, it's a, not a six percent. It's fourteen percent, or fourteen and three eighths. And the six percent is, is is commodity indexed. So if your index or if your uh, commodity prices go up, so does your your principal and your mortgage payments. And so does your ability to pay. Yes, but it's a great thing when you're starting right at the bottom of the bottom of the pe uh, pile, and everybody's just about ready to go broke. Well, these, uh, I think this is a very uh, constructive, innovative program. This uh, provides a 6% uh, loan to farmers that will adjust as uh, commodity prices go up and down. As you said, it's a $700 million program, and that, I think, will be of good help to farmers. We've also uh, brought in these uh, farm debt review panel boards uh, uh, that will allow farmers who, have who are in financial difficulty to uh, get some assistance as to how they work themselves out of these debt problems. Finally, we are going to see lower interest rates in this country, and that also will be of help to farmers. But it doesn't help the fruit farmers in the Okanagan, does it, Carla? No, it sure does not. And, and it, it's only good for people with farm credit mortgages. It doesn't help anybody who's... Uh, financing through the bank, and it only helps a person who's got 40 or 20 to 40 percent equity. Equity does not does not feed you. 
you can have equity, but you can still be on the verge of going broke because our commodity prices are so damn low and our expenses are so high. And your government is doing absolutely nothing. So don't forget, we've extended the, the, the farm fuel tax rebate. That's uh, a, an expensive program for the government of Canada. But I, I remind you that every farmer who has a loan is going to have the benefit of those lower interest rates as they come. Thank you. After the break with Michael Wilson. Michael Wilson is pinning his political and party future on the success of his budget. No gore on the floor, but the right budget for the right time. And interest rates might go down below 9.5%. And he's confident he'll break the magic figure of a $30 billion deficit, isn't he? He is. We'll use that clip next year and <laughs> either praise you or boo you. Yeah, I'm go, sure you will. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello? That's you, ma'am. Uh, is it me that's on? Yes, it is, my dear. Okay. Uh, I want to know why the MPs got such a big raise, and he only took a thousand dollars off of them. And he could, they, what they could have did with that raise, they could have paid off a good part of the deficit. <laughs> well, uh, I wish we could have uh, paid off the deficit. The uh, the MPs' raise is not that great in relation to the huge, huge size of that deficit, but uh, the effect of the the thousand dollar cut is uh, more or less to freeze MPs salaries this year that's what we uh, we have done to demonstrate to Canadians that we're putting our money where our mouth is isn't this terrible that people can't uh, about the new ruling on mandatory retirement isn't that crazy it means that civil servants and all these well pensioned people can stay on and leave no gaps at the bottom of the ladder. There's another element to the pension reform we brought in last year, Jack. That provides for more flexible retirement so people can leave at age 55 or 60 uh, uh, under the, the terms of uh, normal pension plans. And I think that will provide more flexibility and probably offset uh, the impact of those who sure, have stayed a little longer. So. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, I think you're being way too hard on low-income people, for example. I recently uh, am unemployed, and when I had to go and apply for my unemployment insurance benefits, immediately I faced a two-week waiting period, for example, that I'm never allowed to make any income f for that period, because if I do, they deduct it off of there. And, not to mention at the end of the year, my UI benefits are low enough, I still have to pay taxes on that money. I ended up owing $800 the last time I was on, on unemployment about five years ago. Well, you're right. Unemployment insurance is taxable because the, the uh, premiums for unemployment insurance are tax deductible as when they go in. That's the, the, uh, the principle for that. But uh, you're, uh, I want to just pick up what you said, that we're not doing anything for low-income Canadians. In fact, we've done an awful lot for low-income Canadians. The spousal allowance for low-income people who are age 60 to 64. The child tax credit increase that I talked about a minute ago. The low-income uh, refundable sales tax credit, which uh, is something we want to build on in the future as we gain some experience. That was brought in in this budget. There are a few other things that we have also done uh, uh, this budget and last budget. And uh, what we're trying very hard to do is get the right balance here so that we are directing more of our resources to those who need it the most, those in lower income brackets. But you have been hidi hiding behind the Forger Commission on this somewhat brutal aspect whereby people with small pensions in their middle age are denied their unemployment insurance because they have a small pension. 
and yet in the house next door, two people can draw unemployment insurance, but a guy with a little pension has deducted from his UIC. That yes, was a but, bad move. But he probably will be able to draw some UIC as well, though, Jack. But Bring him up that, to the that, level of UIC. Yeah, but the, the, the point is that we brought that in prior to the appointment of the Forger Commission, and we felt, and it's been indicated to us indirectly, that changes to the UIC rules now while the Forger Commission is hearing would be wrong. It would be uh, uh, an insult to the Commission itself to do that. You do, do you anticipate the tightening up of overall UIC qualifications and benefits next year? I don't want to prejudge the results of the, the Forger Commission I'm thinking study. financially. I'm not I, thinking... Well, we, we want to, the whole purpose, the whole purpose of this is to see whether in fact there should be some tightening up. I know there are some people who will probably tell you that there should be, but there are others who will say no, there shouldn't be. That's the purpose of what the commission. What do you think? I want to wait and see what the commission has to Go say. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. Uh, hi, my question for you is kind of specialized, but I just wondered uh, what you think my chances are of getting employment in the federal government are uh, in the field of fisheries as a result of your budget. Well, there's not anything directly related to fisheries. Uh, as you've probably seen, there has been some reduction in employment in the fisheries department. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sidney announced that, uh, oh, about two weeks ago. But um, that is all part of the, the tighter control, the tighter management that is there in the federal government uh, at this time. And the reason for it is that if we can get the size of government done, if we can get the size of the deficit down, We'll get better uh, economic activity from the lower interest rates, and then uh, there will be far, far more jobs. And as I've uh, pointed out on a number of occasions, 585,000 jobs have been created since, the, uh, since September of 1984, and that is easily the best job creation record of any of the industrialized countries. But as a result of the reduction in, uh, in uh, fisheries in, in, uh, in the province of B.C., we've had a, a, a serious reduction in the salmon stocks as well. Well, anyway, sir, I've got to move on, but I would say your chances of getting a job in the civil service with 5,000 going this year and a total of 15,000 over, what, five years? are pretty slim, right? Well, there, there will still be hiring, but obviously it's, uh, it's going to be tougher than it was before. From Victoria, go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Yes. Uh, this will be short and brief. I would like to know how you people can justify the spending of some $3 million in a fee paid to an American to show you how to market a gold coin. I'll hang up and wait for your answer. You know the situation on that. No, I'm not sure. I'm not well, aware of that. Well, an American firm was given a contract with a 50,000 uh, 50, fee and a percentage which amounted to $3.5 million to sell our coins. It would seem that the Kruger and sale collapsed, our sales went up, and this American commission agent got $3.5 million for selling our mint coins. To the disgust of the opposition. Well, I, I'm not aware of it, but uh, our coins are sold not just in Canada, but in a, a number of other countries in the world. I would assume that uh, Mr. McGinnis or his Department of Supply and Services uh, received uh, representations. I and, must uh, say, in and, all and fairness, the proportion of uh, the market that went to Canadian gold coins jumped from 30 percent to 60 percent. Well, I think there's, there's your answer It just there. seemed a bit hef hefty for an American commission agent. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Wilson, I would like to ask why, uh, as a single parent, I'm putting my daughter into university. I cannot claim her tuition fees uh, the, the, on, the, on my income tax. Well, the, the tuition fees are claimed uh, by the, I think they can only be claimed by the student. That, uh, nothing has changed there. That's the same as uh, has been in the, the tax law for a number of years. Your time is up, Mr. Wilson. I don't mean politically, I mean on the program, but I just want to, to reiterate that you reject any suggestion that the two uncertain economic assumptions will spoil your predictions for your magic 30 billion and your interest rates of nine and a half or less. Jack, I stand by what I said, but let me just point out that uh, uh, as the year goes by, there are bound to be changes in this assumption or that assumption as there were in this, uh, this fiscal year just ending. But we made adjustments and the result of those adjustments is that the, we hit the target that we set for ourselves, $33.8 billion this year, because we are committed to getting this deficit down because the benefits are going to be felt by 
everybody across this country in every nook and cranny. That's but, the, the goal of this government, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've had this good job creation but record. Are you telling us we must tighten our belts, pull up our socks, and be ready for tougher times ahead with more unemployment in certain areas? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that uh, we have demonstrated in every province there have been no, more jobs created since, uh, since September of 1984. And uh, we want to continue that record. We're very proud of that record. We created more jobs in the last year and a half than in all of the Western European countries. That's in absolute terms, in all the Western European countries. That's a pretty good record. My thanks to Michael Wilson, Minister of Finance. Next, uh, uh, Trudeau's pollster, Marty Goldfarb, isn't it? After the break. On the phone from the Parliament buildings in Victoria is our man Eli Sopo and going to give us the major recommendations of uh, Brian's Wild Brian Williams Wilderness Committee. They're the people who were thrown in to make a decision or a recommendation about logging on Lyle Island and the Moresby's. Go ahead, Eli. Well, Jack, uh, if we could just restrict the Lyle Island at this point, because there are 16 recommendations for a lot of parks, but the South Moresby, of course, is the most controversial. Right. Uh, in the South Moresby, they're basically saying make most of it a park and have a little bit of logging on Lyle Island. Well, that's just fine and dandy, unless you're a forest company with a lot of timber rights in the South Moresby, like McLuhan, Lodale, and Western Forest Products. Uh, what the Wilderness Committee is recommending to government is that these companies be somehow compensated, either to get timber rights somewhere along the West Coast, as they say, or to work out some other sort of compensation. Uh, when I pressed Williams on this a bit, Brian Williams, the, the chairman of the committee, said, well, how much is this going to cost and what's it going to mean to jobs? He has no answers to that. He says, well, that's something we're going to have to work out. In other words, what he said is you can log, continue to log on parts of Lyle Island, leaving Windy Bay as an ecological reserve, no doubt. Yeah. And you can't log anywhere else in the Moresby's? I'm talking about Western Forest. That's right. Nowhere else in the South Moresby. In that other words, should be uh, made into a... Uh, uh, park. What they're saying is that uh, let's uh, let logging go ahead as is for about three years until things work out and to give the companies, a, uh, as they call a plan transition stage. Um, and uh, if, if they can't work out a deal with the, with the federal government to create a national park, then the province will, will have to go in there alone and try to work something out. In other words, TFL 24, on which is based the output of the Squamish and the um, Port Alice pulp mills and the sawmills, will not, for at least some years, be available for logging. Well, no, that's exactly right, Jack. And not only that, but I think there are a couple of sawmills who are relying on timber from that area also. Now, Three sawmills. Yeah, exactly. And if it's one thing to say to them, we're going to rearrange tenure rights and, and recut the pile over the place, but I wonder what a pulp mill or a sawmill operator thinks who's, who suddenly now has, has a new area to get his timber from. There's okay. a lot of unanswered questions here. So therefore, it looks like the environmentalists have at least temporarily won most of the battle because Lyle Island has been logged for 40 years and continuing logging on Lyle Island doesn't make a damn bit of difference. Well, I just spoke to an environmentalist actually from, uh, from the South Moresby and they're very unhappy, Jack. They're saying, well, our bottom line is no logging in the South Moresby. There's been enough logging there. It's gone on, as you say, for 40 years or so. We'll watch you on the news, Eli. Thanks very much. Thanks. We'll see you later. Bye. Uh, change of pace, finance, Lyle Island, about which I get emotional, and a pleasant discourse with uh, the nation's most famous pollster. Mind you, he was even more famous when his client, Mr. Trudeau, and the Liberal Party were in power. And he is, of course, <laughs> Marty Goldfarb. Now, Marty, I've been in this business a long while, and so have you. I have no idea how you can make a half a dozen telephone calls uh, send out 42 postcards and come back and tell the politicians precisely what they must and must not do or whether or not they should call an election. I mean, are you really a, what's the word? We're not a soothsayer. Merlin the magician. No, we're not. I'm not Merlin the magician. What we do use is some uh, probability theory, statistical theory, to select samples. And within the selection of those samples, you can predict behavior reasonably efficiently. Have you ever been wrong on a major political poll for the P Liberal Party? We've never been off more than a half of one percent. Did you predict the trouncing in the last day, uh, the first, in the Tory sweep? That was not difficult to predict. Uh, never more than one half of one percent out? Yes. Now, you pollsters, you are also used as a, what's the word, double, 
as a negative influence for politicians. In other words, when Mr. Mulroney won't talk to me, can I presume he's up in the polls and that the advice is keep your lips sealed, you don't have to say anything, you look good in television and you'll win the next election? You can't blame the messenger for all of the problems that you and the media have. Um, you may want to talk to Mr. Mulroney and he may not want to talk to you. I mean, he, there's sometimes when you're defensive and sometimes when you're aggressive. Now, let me tell you that again. Politics is a game of chess. Just a minute. Uh, he, Mr. Mulroney, would always want to talk to almost anybody, as you know, <laughs> given the right circumstances. And he would certainly want to talk to me. But, you see, it's you people who advise his tacticians. Keep your mouth shut. You're ahead in the polls. Now, is that a fair assumption on my part? No. It really is not a fair assumption. Well, now, you would have been a liberal pollster, but even talking about Norman Atkins, if you gave a poll to Atkins showing Mulroney's way ahead, wouldn't he whisper in Mulroney's ear, keep your mouth shut? Except that, you know, you're dealing with individuals. Mr. Mulroney will decide for himself when and how he should speak. Certainly, my uh, clients, I've never been able to influence them to the point where they listen to every word you say. You're one of the inputs. A prime minister has 30 or 40 inputs. He has a whole prime minister's office feeding him with knowledge, and not only knowledge, but telling him what to do. Mm -hmm. um, my sense in dealing with uh, political leaders is that they use polls for, to help them make judgments. Remember, information is simply a device for leverage in decision making. What you want to do is reduce risk. Let me give you a real brutal example. I'll keep it simple for, uh, because you're from Toronto, so you understand. If I'm planning, say, to bring in some major change in law, like opening bordellos yes. in British Columbia. Yes. Would I come to you and say, find me the temper on the establishment of, and opening of bordellos in B.C.? Oh, you, we may find the temper of opening bordellos in B.C., but I can also demonstrate many examples. The best one is capital punishment. Clearly, the population has signaled that it would like a return to capital punishment. Clearly, our political leaders, our elected representatives, have sent a signal to the population, and they're not prepared to move on it. You are crafty. That is the only issue on which they're not prepared to move if it would help them get elected. No, I think there are many other issues that they have not been prepared to move. I mean, if you ask people uh, on universality, the population does not think universality, that is a break of universality, is good for the country. Yet we have a government that's beginning to move away from universality. Oh, yes, social allowances. Good yeah. point. And it would be your function to do a poll on that, would it? We would do polls for a government on letting them understand how sensitive the public are to certain proposed acts that the government may be thinking. Then the government has to sort out how best to either move in a direction, how to sell its strategy, or how to back off away from what it thought it should do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you are evil. No, I don't think I'm evil. I have five I kids and you. they like me. No, it's dangerous. You're dangerous. <laughs> no, we're not dangerous. Remember what you're you You're a device which en enables a politician to avoid going, acting on principle and policy. A politician is no better than anybody else who wants to stay alive. What he has to understand is where he's getting into trouble with the electorate. And he has to learn how to sell his ideas. Otherwise, he'll never get a chance to play in the game. More with Marty Goldfarb. Martin Goldfarb, I'm sorry. They call you Marty, don't Either they? one. Uh, of Goldfarb Associates? Consultants. Consultants. To the social credit government? We do some consulting for the government. We'll talk about that after the break. <laughs> Martin Goldfarb, the pollster. Are you the top pollster still? I oh, there's that so. fellow with the long hair, Greg or Greg or somebody. Uh, he's actually a talented young man. And he's the Tory pollster? Yes. And then there's a guy in Winnipeg. I don't know who that is. Remember him? I remember him. He only lasted a little while, but <laughs> You're not gonna I remember mention, him. You're not going to mention his name. I'm not going to mention his name. <laughs> now, social credit. What polling do you do for social credit? We have done some polling on social policy for the uh, government, uh, on health care. We've done some polling on uh, issues like uh, the environment, on forestry. We've done polling on uh, things like uh, the insurance. Uh, ICBC? Insurance. Yes. Yes, I remember that. 
So we have done some polling. This government uh, doesn't do a lot of polling, but it does some, and we've been involved in some social policy polling. In other words, before they make a change, they want to know what the public's attitude might be. Yes, and I think that's intelligent. What they want to do is understand the trade-offs before they uh, make specific changes. How about a political polling for them? For instance, right now, just to give you the scenario, and I will not involve you in this conversation, I'll merely make a statement because you are potential clients over there. We, I think that Mr. Bennett was all set to go for an election. All set to go. Before Expo. But my tum-tum is that the polls recently have been 50-50. And so therefore we're not going to have an election until during and after oh, yeah. Expo. Now, you'd be the kind of person our pollster who could advise the right time to call an election. Is yes. that correct? Yes, we could do that. How do you do that? We would do I mean, I'd like a little of the detail of that. How you do we it? We would do samplings of the public. We'd find out what the public mood is, what the issues that are moving the public mood, either up or down. We'd find out what the impressions of the opposition is, both the leader and the party. What are the fears against the opposition? Clearly, when we do uh, work in British Columbia, you have to understand there is a whole marketplace that is still sensitive about the NDP taking over this government. Mr. Barrett's performance has not been forgotten. And even though there is a new leader, people are still sensitive about the previous NDP record. That hasn't gone away. So what you do is you do all the polls, you, do, you question different parts of the province, you analyze where the seats are, what the vote's going to be in different sections of the province, and then at the appropriate time you advise, remember we're in a parliamentary system, where the government in power decides when and how to call the election. You will actually analyze on the basis of your sampling and selected writings how the vote is liable to come out on election day. Yes. That's a, so how many, I mean, that's a big job. How many writings would you analyze? All of them? We, would, we have a model where we could analyze all of the writings. What you have is a projective model that we build into our computer. It's taken us years to build it. So what we have done is taken historical data, build it into our per, per computer, add survey data, and we can project what's going to happen in the writing. All right. You should understand, behavior is very patterned. Things don't change that fast. People don't shift attitudes that quickly. In other words, it doesn't really matter, you're telling me, what the hot issue is this very day. We might have had some real messy issue on one side or the other. But when you go to do your polling, that one issue... It's rare that one issue, Jack, influences voter behavior. What really happens is a whole series of things in one's voter behavior. If you can move in most ridings the vote by anywhere three to five percent, it's more than enough to win. In most cases, if you move a riding, uh, the behavior, the voting behavior by two percent, you've got it. But that, you don't do that. All you do is find out if it can be moved. We find out if it can be moved, and we try to also find out the hot buttons that might move it. All right, supposing I was asking you to do a poll today on any subject at all. I can't think of one offhand. Well, we'll do a, a poll on, you, on your performance. On a poll on my performance. How many samplings would you make? Uh, in British Columbia, we would do a sample of 800, and we could break that down and be within a statistical reliability of plus or minus 5%. And you would break it down by age groups and sexes? We could sexes. break it down by age, sex, income, education, and even in some respects by region of the province. And you could give me what you would guarantee as a proper I could take the population to... We could tell you whether you should retire quickly or whether you should stay on. <laughs> I don't like that. Now, I don't want you to do that poll. Because <laughs> I'll make up my own mind. I don't need some <laughs> damn uppity pollster to tell me what to oh, do. Oh, well, you might need it. But, you know, if the numbers were right, you probably could ask for more money from this station. <laughs> Who wants to talk to Marty Goldfarb? He's from Toronto. He's still a nice fellow. He was... Oh, did you ever come face to face socially with Pierre? Oh uh, yes, many times. Is did it... you find him a little bit austere to deal with? No, I found Mr. Trudeau a very unique person in this sense. He always made you feel that he was delighted to see you. He always made you feel that it was obvious that you that he would know who you were, but he was always surprised that you would know who he was. <laughs> he had this tremendous gift of getting people to relax with him. Not me, he didn't. And he had, I always found he had this, and he was a very, very, um, 
he was unique, he was bright, he was conceptual, he was, remember this was a man trained in Jesuit thinking, he was Socratic in his whole process of acquiring information and using it. But he still managed to mix with us on, on occasion. Oh, no, no, I thought Mr. Trudeau could mix with anybody. Uh, your calls to Marty Goldfarb, Friday morning, let's be funny or something, after the break. Well, I'm going to conduct my poll on Marty Goldfarb. Do you think that pollsters should be removed from society by capital punishment? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jack, I hope you don't do too many calls. I'm afraid that some politicians might act on the results. <laughs> Marty and I have uh, tangled together on various national panels. Isn't that good fun, right? We've tried. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. I would like to ask your guests, what's his feeling about this thought of mine, that the announcement of poll results prior to an election unduly influenced the voters in arriving at their individual choices? Uh, let me respond by this sense. If you announce the results and they did have an influence, then the prediction couldn't ever happen because the influence would have influ that is the the influence would have made the prediction uh, inaccurate. The reality is is we can do a poll and predict the results, announce them, and after the election our prediction tends to turn out to be within a half to one percent of our prediction. And as a result, I have to conclude that announcing polls and publishing polls has very little influence on behavior. If the that's the case, would you then uh, not disagree that uh, with, with um, uh, some form of uh, rule whereby you were not allowed to announce the results of a poll, no, uh, I, say three weeks prior or a month prior to an election? No, I wouldn't disagree with it. I think, you know, what the public has demonstrated, that is the, the genius of our system, is, that the, is, is the wisdom of the public. They make good choices over time. And I think the more information the public has, the better choices they can make. I have no hesitation in trusting the public with more information. I think you're the shepherd leading sheep. Thank you. You didn't win that one. Who? You. Oh, come on. He says you're the shepherd leading sheep. Oh, he had no other response. That's a good response. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't, wasn't accurate. We should have thought of it myself. <laughs> it's not a question of accuracy, Sidon. It's a question of making the right right post at the right time. You, you cut me off. Yes, I did <laughs> deliberately. This is my poll. Go ahead to Marty Goldfarb. Good morning. Good morning, Marty. I How are you? Stephen Baker said that polls were supposed to be used by dogs only. <laughs> <laughs> Well, politicians sometimes act like that. Well, I'll tell you something. That last caller there said that uh, his, his regards to publicizing the polls of results does not affect me or many of other people because basically uh, if you're going to vote, your mind is already preset before any uh, polls come out. I would assume that in a society like ours, where we have a, a fairly good standard of education, where we have a lot of media and a lot of attention paid to politics, that most people make up their own mind and very few people act, as Jack would say, sheep. That's correct. Oh, by the way, one thing too, you did a poll uh, for uh, the other uh, uh, television network some, about, some eight months, nine months ago to do with the demographics of this country in regards to immigration. And uh, your poll stated that somewhere in the vicinity, I think it was the 78 or 80 percent of the population did not want to change the style of uh, the population in the or the type of population in the country it's basically saying they didn't they did not want third world immigration uh, do the politicians ever uh, take heed to this at all well there's two things it's one understanding what the politician it's one understanding what the public wants or thinks it's wants it's another thing under uh, explaining to the politician how it can sell a fair policy to the public at large so i would say the reason for doing a poll like that is to help the politician understand how it should go about selling a fair policy to the people at large. Fair enough. Was he right in the results of your poll? Is that no. He's not right? No. Okay. People in this country are uh, quite uh, magnanimous to most immigrants. There is a slight prejudice against people from the third world, mainly uh, uh, black people. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I want to know what Mr. Goldfarb thinks about the poor turnout we have at, uh, uh, at the voters' 
uh, like the biggest election, the biggest turnout we've had in B.C. in many, many years, as quoted on this program some time ago, was 43 point something. No, no. At least 57 percent of the voters don't vote. Well, let me say this. Uh, it depends on the level of uh, the election. In federal elections, we get about seven, a little over 70 percent vote. Provincial elections, and I don't know what the specific numbers are in B.C., it's close to that. Our municipal elections tend to get a very low turnout. So I would say that for, for most of the important kinds of decisions being made, people tend to want to vote. Yeah, and I, would, I think provincially it's around the 70% level too. And I subscribe to the theory that if they don't know any better, they shouldn't vote anyway. Well, I wouldn't subscribe to that theory. I think the more involvement that we bring, for example, through shows like this, where you're talking about politicians and two politicians, the more involvement we have with the political process, the more people will vote. Go ahead from Victoria. Hello, Jack. Hi. hi. Uh, could I ask you one thing before I ask Marty? Certainly. No comment. <laughs> are, are you smoking, Phil, or, 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 or did you stay quit after cold turkey day? No comment. Yes, I'm still smoking. Who? Oh, no. I've been sabotaged. Look. Fire that woman. Yes, I am. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm ashamed of it. I'm disgusted. But I am trying. Keep trying. Not very hard. <laughs> <laughs> Marty. Yeah. Could you tell me how you get into this business? Because it seems like a really good scam to me. <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd, I'd like to open my own polling business. You know. Well, like I think what you should do then is uh, first train... I trained as an anthropologist and then trained uh, gra postgraduately as a sociologist with a lot of courses in statistics and behavior research. Uh, once you do that, then I think you may have the criteria to go out and try to do some good research. I thought you'd just use kids off the street to do polling. No, if I was going to do that, I'd use my own. I have five and uh, <laughs> that would be enough. Thank you. I have a question. You've been out here polling for the sun. Yes. Now, what do we... I mean, they've changed the face of the paper. Well, they changed more. They changed the format of the paper. That's what I mean. And they the made format. it much easier to read, and they made it a more interesting paper to, to handle. And I think that's going to help them a lot. Did you poll for content as well as form? Yes, we did, and there's a whole series of things we suggested they get involved with in content as well. People here in British Columbia want more local news. Uh, People in Vancouver specifically are very proud of their community. They want more local stories, they want more about Vancouver, and they want more positive news. They don't want the news to be so negative. Don't want the news to be so negative. Happy news! They want a balance between, I mean, it's always as if uh, this city and the people feel that the press are under siege. Somehow they'd like to see it lighten up a bit. Well, I've had a couple of confrontations here recently with one cabinet minister who set the party line for the next election, which was shoot the messenger. Don't attack the NDP, attack the media. Well, I'm not saying we should attack the media, but somehow the media, you know, there are occasions when individuals, regardless of what party you belong to, do something reasonably well. They should be congratulated. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not going to press my questions on that too far. I'm going to keep Marty here till the end. After break. Do you mind? Not at all. Go ahead to Marty Goldfarb. This morning, a uh, very interesting program, Marty. Thank you. Uh, with, with, with the, uh, with the uh, ability of hindsight, Marty, uh, what is your version on that, that Dewey Truman fiasco that happened? Dewey Truman. You remember the Dewey papers were on the yes, street that he was, the, he was president of the United States? Yes, right. the election in 1948 when the Chicago Tribune published the, uh, the Dewey was president. But not only that, in New York. Um, I think, though, that our techniques and technology has advanced considerably in the last 30 years. Uh, in, in the early 40s, there was a couple of things wrong. One, we didn't have the ability to poll close enough to the election uh, because it took so long to process the data. We didn't have the high-speed computers we have today. I can poll, for example, on a Friday night and give you the answer by 6 o'clock Saturday morning Gee. because we collect the data and process it at the time it's being collected. So that's easy, yeah. Now, given, given your background in, uh, in anthropology and sociology... Yes? Uh, <clears throat> would you agree that, uh, that the, uh, the uncanny Scotsman that who Webster is 
uh, gives him uh, part of his success in picking out his guests and his, his program success. Well, I think Webster is more than uncanny. Uh, duh. <laughs> Thanks, old boy. I'm not very good at taking these sincere compliments. I'm too modest by nature. And if you believe that, you believe anything. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. I was wondering, uh, like, as far as everybody's talking about polling and that, but how about a politician taking an acting career? Because I think that Reagan's proved that. If you're a good actor, you can yeah. pull anything over the people. Well, you, you, you should be careful. Because a person is an actor doesn't mean that he's not intelligent. And I'm not saying that Mr. Reagan is a brilliant man, but I don't think you should hold a person's uh, occupation as a negative. No, you've missed the point of the question. The point of the question made was that the image of Reagan when he became president was this guy, which he was some kind of slow-witted dullard who couldn't think on his feet. Now, he does some silly things, like uh, in five minutes we'll bomb Moscow, you know. Or, but the guy shows an incredible... Uh, Literate response to snap questions. This guy is anecdotal. He speaks well in front of a camera. He knows how to tell stories, and that's what television is all about. Great stuff, yeah. It's, it's amazing how my image of Regan has changed since all his performances on television. Well, I, you know, I think that we didn't really know him when he was governor of California. Go ahead, please, from Powell River. Yeah, good morning. You touched briefly, Marty, on social issues. I was, I've been listening to the news a couple of days ago, I've been stewing ever since, about this business of, you know, the homosexuals into the armed forces, into the RCMP. Yes. Now, do you think any poll was done there? And I'm wondering how our politicians can be so gutless and brainless. I don't know if there was a poll done there, and I don't understand what the implications would be for the armed services or the, uh, the RCMP in including homosexuals uh, as, as active members of the force. Well, but right I, away, I look at it, I'm an average Canadian, a bit more than average, six kids, one more than you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we treat our, teach our children to respect the RCMP and authority. How do you continue doing that? I mean, my point is... is uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure if you did a poll on that, you would have 90% dead against this policy. How well, do they go ahead and go against that? Well, I, but I also think that sexual, you know, prejudice is something you have to fight. And if people are prejudiced, you have to show them away. A person's sexual preference, preferences shouldn't prejudice the society against that person. Now, I would be... It should limit them to their, the amount of trust, I think, or... It no. depends. I'm old-fashioned, I realize that. Yeah, he's old-fashioned. I'm kind of old-fashioned, too. And here you're bringing up your six kids in a strictly, strictly, presumably, what you regard in your uh, orientation as a properly moral way. And these other matters you do not either want to advise to nor consent to. It's a very delicate social issue. It's and he may be right on the 90%, despite the liberal wish, small l liberal wish, Jack, to understand. You have to come back. Is the individual a citizen? Has he broken the law? Does he deserve to have all rights before the law? If you accept the concept of democracy, then why should we be prejudiced against any individual because of sexual preferences? Well, there was a time in the RCMP it would be because of security risks. I'm not sure that's an accurate reflection of reality. There's no demonstration that homosexuals are more security risks than other deviants. Well, dealt with as such for a long period by the various security services. I think that was our own prejudices. There you have it, boy. But hey, th thank you. Thank you very much. He put the question well, I thought, too. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, over the years, I've uh, listened to all of these things on polls, and I've taken little polls myself where I worked. And I've asked people if they've ever been polled, and I've never met anybody who's been polled, <laughs> and I've never met anybody who has met somebody else who's been polled. <laughs> <laughs> we are working people. <laughs> And I, you know, I, we, we're not necessarily in the downtown core, so I don't think we ever get polled, so our opinion never, ever, ever, ever is heard. <laughs> Let me uh, say, I don't know why you haven't been polled, but we generate random numbers on a little computer and ask, uh, I guess we interview a couple of hundred thousand people a year in Canada, and maybe uh, five times that number in the United States. So I don't know why you haven't been pulled. You must have a funny number. Oh, I, I believe that the polls are taken in a strategic place. I don't think they are. No, it's I think you should go out and uh, in lunch breaks and poll the guys in a working 
Give me your number and I'll make sure you get pulled. Yeah, do you want to be pulled? Sure, sure. What, what's your number? Ask me a question. No, Ask no. Me a question. <laughs> Man, no, I don't bother his number. Thanks very much. That's quite funny, though. <laughs> You're only doing 800 polls and me out of two and a half million people. It's plenty. Plus or minus 5%. You know, you have to understand something. There's a science to selecting a sample. You don't have to select the whole universe to find out what the society is going to think. Mm -hmm. 800 is more than enough. Take your word for it. Go ahead, please. My, my question is exactly the same as the uh, previous caller, except I would like him to be a little more specific, specific as to how he constructs his representative sample. Uh, I have lived in different parts of Canada. I'm now in my 70s, and I still have never <laughs> even been uh, polled by a political pollster. So there is something so wrong with your representative sample. Well, you may just not fall into the sample. Let me explain how you select a sample. You I, know, I, I know my, my background is statistical sampling, so don't try to kid me. Well, I'm not trying to kid you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to somehow tell you how we select a sample. The fact that you fell out is a, a statistical aberration. <laughs> oh, it, oh, that's it. Did you cop out in that question? No, I just somehow we just never selected his number. So that becomes an aberration. That's an aberration. Well, the chances are that 250,000 to one to be Every picked. time you, the chances are 25 million to one every time you select a number. 25 million to one. Marty, um, you've done the Vancouver Sun. Are you still working for the Libs? Yes. <laughs> they'll be a long while before they're back in power. Uh, having lost Trudeau, I mean, Turner's well, no, not I'm good, not sure about that. You know, there is a great deal of frustration in this country about this government. There is a sense that maybe we're, we may have uh, a, a tiller, but we have no rudder. Would you like Trudeau to be the rudder? I'd love him to be the rudder. After the break, my thanks to Martin Coulter. John Turner, leader of the Liberal Party, will be here Monday morning. And you're going to meet Michael Drosnan, who wrote an incredible book on Citizen Hughes, you know, the famous Howard Hughes. But the first section will be with John Turner, leader of the Liberal Party. I thought Marty Goldfarb was very good this morning. Didn't get much out of Wilson. Asked him the right questions, I think. Monday, 9 a.m., precisely. Expo 86, 56 days to go.